such a large audience. All right, here we go. Uh, I get the black pieces because our opponent is doing a simul, and it's traditional to give the simul host the white pieces. Um, so just as a reminder to everybody here in the audience, we are playing atomic chess, and the rule there is that if a capture occurs, everything in the radius of that capture, other than a pawn, is immediately removed from the board. So it's a little bit different than normal chess, and quite frequently you can just leave a piece hanging and it just won't be captured. I'm sure I'll have to point this out uh, time and time again that this is actually an atomic game. I mean, I know it. Anybody listening at this one instant knows it. But as people meander their way in here, assuming they do, um, they'll, well, I'm sure some will figure it out. So knight f3, sure, that happens in standard chess. f6 is pretty uncommon. All right, so I'm trying to remember. Already I'm out of book. I know, I think c6 as well as knight h6 are considered a theory here. So if c6, um, then I think the main line runs knight d4, knight b5, and then the other knight to b5, uh, I think. Whereas if I play knight h6, uh, h3 is the move, I think. Wait. Um, I have to remember this. This is actually kind of an important moment in the game. And it's not often that I see this uh, knight c3 so early in the game. So this is one idea. But I think there's also some ideas with like knight d5. Um, that's what's got me concerned at the moment. Well, so I think knight h6 is playable, but I think it also runs into g4 or h3. Hmm. Okay, so I've got to derive the theory here because I know you guys aren't going to spoil me. You're going to leave me to my own devices to figure this out. I know I've seen c6 here before, but I wonder why knight h6 is not the main move. Like, what's the deal? If I do knight h6, knight g5, surely can't be correct. Now that just loses. Let, let's play knight h6. There is a very real possibility that I have just lost the game. Um, but I need to learn from this. So what I'm just, just given the hour of day, I'm not sure if knight d5 um, is something that's decisive or not. Because I see I have like resources like e6 and knight a6 to try to help develop my pieces, as well as threats of knight g4 and knight f2 and knight e3 sometimes. So I'm not sure if c6 was necessary or useful there. Uh, I'm not nearly a strong enough theoretician to know which pieces I need to keep in the opening and which ones I can sack. All right, so this does run into g4. Obviously, if I take on g4, knight d5 is pretty important there. So I need to stop the immediate knight d5. But then, yeah, this knight b5 idea does happen. Um, it's possible this might also be a transposition into knight d4 and knight f5 lines. I'm not sure. There's much I don't know about a theory uh, of this game. So we'll have to look this up afterward. I'm sure the opening database will happily clarify uh, my errors. Again, this is a 20 minute with 30 second increment simul. So 
despite the fact that it looks like it's going to finish pretty quickly, um, and despite the fact that this is really fast for a simul, it's not going to take like a literal 40 minutes to complete unless the game finishes early. Uh, this could well take an hour or so. But it's cool to have the chance to play against National Master. Um, I am tempted to go look at his other games that he's got in progress. I do know, though, and I'm amused by the possibility that he's switching between every variant, basically, from game to game. And so we just got to keep him thinking. Um... In particular, I always found it uh, a little bit amusing. Just, I don't know, the, the chaos that is... Oh, D4. Nice. Clever. Um, but yeah, I find the chaos that's introduced by forcing the host to switch from variant to variant as he goes board to board and remember which is which. It says in the upper left corner while he's playing, but... Um, still funny to have all those context switches. So right now I'm calculating knight takes pawn. Uh, looks pretty damn convincing. Um, I guess the one downside? Well, no. I was gonna say, um, that I'm going to play e6 and d6 soon and just get all my pieces developed. Um, and or I have queen a5 check if that knight c3 ever moves, but that gets into some really complicated... Mm, well, with the g4 and knight f3 removed... Um, okay, let's get rid of these arrows here. So there's still this threat on the board, but I have this potential idea of hitting e2... Uh, and possibly even going up here and hitting F2. So, I gotta look into making these arrows a little bit lighter or somehow more prominent on this board. Maybe change it to like cyan. Um, but yeah, even if he plays knight E4, I've got plenty of ways to attack this king. I need to see where this goes. So, current threat is queen to h5. And from h5, I hit e2. Could potentially hit f2 pretty quickly. Um, I think the easiest way to combat this is just playing b4 directly. Or maybe there's indirect ways to combat this by playing like h4, h5, or e4, or... I don't know. But I think black is going to get um, developed very quickly here. So as long as I just don't immediately get mated in the opening, I should be fine. Now I guess maybe uh, white's got this idea. Um, uh, what else might white be threatening? Like, White also wants to play something like that. But I think I can meet that with just d6. Stopping the pawn from being able to get into the d6 square. Well, that's interesting. Look at that. So if I do an arrow up from my pawn... Okay, it only touches the backmost arrow. Or, I'm sorry, the closest arrow here. My d6 pushes this arrow back a little bit. But the other arrowhead stays put. Interesting. Well, that's exactly what I hoped for. I, this was an optical illusion. I thought it also pushed back against the head of the first arrow, which I was going to say doesn't look right. No, that's just an optical illusion. Um, but yeah, I think pawn d6 is on my agenda. Um, I don't really think I have... Well, I'm going to have to push, like, pawn g6 as well. Otherwise, uh, my king side falls apart. Um, 
He might also be intending e3 and queen somewhere. I don't know, maybe queen h5. So, but if I push g6, he's not going to move the queen to h5. He's going to be pushing it somewhere else. But where? Uh, where would that queen want to go? Hmm. Chess is tricky. Oh, but yeah, I can't just push by a king pawn uh, without allowing this center pawn to run. Um, I do want to blockade the queen pawn. And then hopefully get this damn bishop out somewhere. I don't really care where. Um, yeah, probably g4, maybe h3. I think it's a matter of taste there. I think white has not successfully developed. Yeah, we don't need this all the way across the board. You get the idea. From a5, I really could go anywhere. Also, of d5, I have queen b6, which is hitting f2. That's interesting. So queen b6 hits f2, it hits b2. So maybe I can allow white's pawn to run up to d6 here if I can somehow ensure that all my pieces still get developed and my king gets to safety. If I could somehow protect my king for long enough, I could trade my queen on b2 for all these pieces. Um, a c3 knight, b2 pawn, and bishop and rook. As long as I can defend against these remaining bishop, queen, and rook, uh, queen b6 might not be a bad idea. And of course, this is all speculating. Okay. Here, let's clear some arrows. So, one idea. Oh, queen b6 now only has a single threat. Yeah, pawn to e4 makes a good deal of sense. Plus, this queen b6 now runs into um, bishop to b5. And my queen can't do anything useful. All right, so a typical idea in atomic chess is to play pawn e6 and pawn f6. We've already pushed pawn f6. Um, don't need this arrow. So, oh, you might even do bishop b5 or even knight b5, jeez. This is something to look out for, isn't it? Um, well, yeah, what do I do about that? I could do queen a5. He does pawn b4, my queen transfer. Yeah, he's also got queen h5 as a threat. So I think I want to get my queen out to start to try to meet some of these threats. I also want to push pawn d5, I also want to push pawn e6. Um, I've got a lot of desires here. Yeah, pawn d5 is too risky. Um, pawn d6 really leaves my king stranded in the center. I can't do that this instant. Um, Yeah, let's get the queen out. This can't be terrible. So this pins the knight. Um, meanwhile, so like his idea of using the square twice is a bit slowed down at the moment. I'm also covering the square against um, this possibility. Now, he might just put a piece on b5, just to spite me. Um, and to allow his queen to go there once again. 
but I think more logical at this point is probably just something like trying to break this open. But I think I can meet that with pawn d6, just blockading the pawn. I don't think he has any uh, forceful enough follow-up. Uh, yeah, I think my counterplay is sufficient here. Oh, also, note in that variation I was pointing out earlier with pawn d5 and queen b6, there was pawn takes pawn, removing the queen. So, I'm improving at this game as I <laughs> play it. Um, man, I have a lot to learn about this, don't I? I haven't played very much atomic chess um, ever. Let's check the mail. Since we've got a minute... Yep, that's mail, all right. That's certainly mail. All right, let's check this mail. It's good to know. Got a typo there. Got to go fix that. The appropriate people. Let's check this mail. Ooh. What's this about? What is this about? Soliciting a response. I can certainly respond to that. Alright, pawn e5. Uh, occurs to me, do I have sounds off? Like, I should hear a move sound each time a move occurs. Sound. Okay, that was just really faint. So this stops me from protecting the h5 square. However, this gives me time to play e6 and get my bishop active. So, yeah, I think the key question here is do I push e6 or d6 first? And I don't think I can push both of them. I think it's one or the other. And usually the move is e6 in order to get the f8 bishop developed and be able to castle. However, here we got a pretty peculiar situation. And yeah, maybe d5 is something worth considering. I don't think I'm going to castle kingside, which is kind of atypical. Um, usually I do aspire to castle kingside, but here... Kingside Castle doesn't look so appealing <laughs> for so many reasons. So I'm thinking pawn d5, just lock this up. Um, it's very possible he just plays pawn e6 against that, and it's difficult to develop the bishop. But hmm, you maybe have to push e6 first and then try for d5. It's one heck of a mess. Yeah. In fact, that's what we have to do. Um, so give the king some breathing room. Try to get the stuff developed. I am concerned about queen f3 to f7, but I don't see a way to counter it. I guess bishop to e7, bishop f6 is the idea. If you place queen f3 first, though, maybe I'm forced to push f5. 
put that on the board. Is there anything else here? I think that's it. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, I guess I still want to push my center pawn. Um, my development is pretty atrocious here. But I can't go opening all the center files either. I think this is this kind of position is the most compelling reason why black should not bother playing knight h6 against knight f3 knight c3 because if I leave the knight on h6 bishop takes h6 and I'm just not happy at all um, but by taking on g4 I've given myself a position that's very difficult to defend also so or very difficult to develop in, really. If I push all my center pawns one square, I can't develop either of my bishops. Um, and this half-open g-file is really terrible news if I ever want a castle kingside. Having that g-pawn, if white had a g-pawn, I could sometimes play g6 to barricade the g-pawn and um, protect my king for a little bit. So, that, yeah, an atomic chest, that g-pawn seems expendable. I think the good news in my favor here is that I am playing in a simul. So, if I play accurately, and if I delay my moves long enough, there is a possibility that my opponent might only get to my board when he's got, like, a couple minutes left on this board. Um... Note that boards are prioritized in the sense that um, the board where the host has the least time is the one that he goes to next. So you could sit there for like half the simul, then make your first move, and the host won't get into your board until your board has the lowest time of all the boards. Um, so if there's a really low increment, in this case we actually have a 30 second increment so it's not such a problem, but hypothetically if you had a really low increment, um, then that host might not get to your board until he has a few seconds left to make his second move. Um, and yeah, again, if there's a really low increment, um, he's going to have difficulty making moves after the second move. But, yeah, here there's actually a 30 second increment. So what I'm banking on is that somehow, I don't know, he's going to get into time pressure. I think he's playing nine games. If I saw right, there were nine challengers in this simul. Maybe ten, I don't know. So... Yeah, my hope for salvation in terms of not losing this game would be um, maybe he gets distracted by the other games. Now, I do question. He's down below seven minutes. I'm going to refresh the page because I don't believe this. No, okay. Okay. Also because I've heard rumors that sometimes... Um, Bad things happen if you don't refresh the page. 
but they these rumors have not been something reproducible. And I was hoping that I could reproduce something there. But no. He just appears to... I don't know. Have disconnected or something? Can I... If I mouse over this and go over his name... No. He seems to have an active connection. I don't get it. Okay. Maybe he's just calculating. Um, Alright, so point number one. King d8 or king e7, and he plays queen e8 check. So this move is forced. Um, no more calculation is necessary. Other moves instantly lose the game. Um, but yeah, point number two would be that you'd normally lead this attack with a bishop to h6. Threatening bishop takes bishop, and then you could do this whole queen h5 and queen h6 thing. But right now, queen h6 doesn't work because I still have my f8 bishop. So he's up to something here. Maybe he's intending queen h3? Or maybe queen h4? This is... yeah, I need to get better at this game. Um, to offer meaningful commentary. All right, so there it is, queen f3. So I was anticipating that I play f5. I thought this might be good enough. Um, he's threatening things like knight b5 and bishop b5, and then taking f6 and then checking and checkmating me. So I was thinking f5, but now I'm also seeing possibilities of like queen h3, queen h4. But I can counter that with queen d8. Then he plays bishop g5 instead, and then moves the queen over to h4. Um, so he's got all these squares to maneuver around in that makes things a bit complicated. Um, makes it difficult to predict where he's going to pop up next. So, also if I move my knight out, um, I lose my queen, which is not that great, is it? <laughs> um, that's not a positive outcome. So, how do I continue development here? I'd really like to be able to move my queen elsewhere along the rank, but it seems that's not happening. Um... But queen b4. So if I take on b2, well, if I play queen b4, he just pushes the pawn. My queen's useless on b4. Um, hmm. Meanwhile, yeah, if I play queen b4, he just takes on f6 and I made it. Okay, so I'm curious what's wrong with f5. Probably a lot, but I just don't know what. He wants to find some way for his queen uh, to invade my position. And I want to find some way for my queen to actually defend it. Because all the rest of my pieces aren't doing a very good job. Um, are not doing a good job defending my king. If anything, they're impeding my ability to castle. Maybe, well no, c5 just gets me killed. Um, that's unfortunate. Well no, c5, he does like bishop b5 and move my knight out to c6. Uh, so let's see, c5, knight c6, bishop b5. Pawn takes c5, blasts everything here. Um, that's not so terrible. There's still some possibilities there. I've seen a lot better, but uh, pawn c5 might be my ticket to getting out of here. Um, 
But on the flip side of that, pawn c5, queen takes b7 um, is a possibility. And that removes everything in the corner and leaves me with the queen, bishop, and a rook. Um, maybe I could still get something out of that, but it's pretty messy. If I could just teleport or wrap my queen around to the king side, that would be great. But I don't have any way to do that without losing my queen right now. Um, and losing the queen might not be the worst thing either. Um, I guess I could also consider trying to pin the knight and get my queen through the center. Which is a super bold... There's so many arrows on the board. Um, I could consider this, pinning this to the king, and then I could move my queen out. Which is ridiculous, but I actually have attacking chances here, so that would be a way to use the said chances. Um, that might be my ticket to freedom while he's distracted playing a whole bunch of games on simul. I'm not sure. Either way, regardless of that works or not, or in practice that works, I'm still curious about my opening choices. Because certainly I can learn something. The thing that I can learn is probably just don't play the thing I played. Um, that thing being uh, knight h6 and then knight takes g4. I burned two tempi to give myself a free pawn, but not really a good position at all. And I'm struggling to develop anything. And, you know, if my opponent ever played one of these things, um, I could learn how to punish it. So, that's there's two reasons. One, to see, like, what do I play in the future uh, is one reason to focus on this. Another reason to focus is um, trying to figure out just theory in general and how um, to punish opponents who make the mistakes that I would make. Because I can't be, this must be a fairly common error to just let your uh, queen side get clammed up like this where nothing can move. Um, I can't be the only person who's ever done that. So... I'm interested in what's the right way to punish such a development mistake. So, yeah, this bishop b4 is very atypical, I would say. Um, usually, you aspire to develop all of... Well, you leave the bishop around your king. You develop all your other pieces first. Unless uh, your king happens to be, like, super safe and you don't need the bishop to keep this bishop and queen away because without this f8 bishop now um, queen to h6 is a serious threat but one easily countered by pawn h5 if not for pawn h5 um, yeah this queen h6 could be lethal uh, he also wants to play bishop f6 hitting my rook but Again, since I have pawn h5, uh, it doesn't matter that I can't protect this h6 square. There's no way for his queen to get into... Um... Okay, now that's interesting. So there's two threats, as far as I can see. Um, well, actually three. So threat number one, pretty obvious. Threat number two is going to c7 and b8 and removing all this. Threat number three is queen h3 and queen h6, or queen h4 and queen e7. But I think I can counter all three threats with a queen move. Well, this third one of taking mb8 will require a knight move at some point, but I think a logical starting point is queen d5. Again, thanks to this pin. 
so I can do queen e4 check if he does anything crazy. Or even queen f3. If he moves the queen away, I could start threatening mate on his king. And suddenly my position's kind of okay. Now he's playing a ton of games in the simul at the same time. And I know he was intending to like somehow get this queen onto e7. Among all his other things he was intending. Or maybe onto uh, like h6 to f8. But this takes too many tempi. Um, there is no direct path to either of these squares. Like, even indirectly, this takes some tempi to make it happen. So this gives me time to get my queen active and pursue his king and get the queens traded so I just don't get checkmated right out of the opening. And then after the opening, we can focus on, um, you know, just trying to get all the pieces out and active. I still think my position's a little bit worse because all my queen side, like bishop, rook, and knight, are not developed. Um, but I don't know. Atomic chess is tricky. All right, so he exchanges queens voluntarily. Um, <laughs> this raises a question of. Like, how do I continue to buy development here? Uh, he's still threatening bishop c7 and bishop takes knight. So I have to consider, do I push my d-pawn to give my knight? Like, do I go d5 or d6? Well, probably d5 if I'm doing anything. Um, so I could do knight d7. Or do I just, like, directly move my knight out to a6? Note that pawn to b5 doesn't really help protect the knight, doesn't shield the knight at all from uh, this bishop capture. So I don't like my knight on a6. I think I do want to push pawn d5, and I think I don't get mated if I play this. Um, there's just nothing immediately menacing my king here. One interesting idea for white might be bishop to e7 stopping me from castling. Um, I'm not sure if that's more or less important than trying to... Oh, also I'm not sure if I my king should castle or not. Um, castling's not looking so wise now, is it? So, what do I do? If he plays h5, well, then he might play f4 first. This is because if he pushes h5, I just push g5. I'm fine. And if he pushes f4, I push past again. But he might change up the move order. Um... Also, I don't like letting this pawn run all the way down the board, so we're going to block it. What I don't know is whether I should be trading my bishop for this knight. Knights are really tricky pieces in atomic chess, but bishops have an extraordinary reach and range. Um, so it might be very... In fact, yeah, knights, while knights are tricky in standard chess, not so much in atomic, now that I think more about it. Um, so, yeah, where do I put my knight? I don't have a way to develop it other than through a6. So I should just play knight a6 directly. Uh, even though that wasn't my original plan. Also, bishop d7 has to be played sooner or later, so why not now? 
Well, no, because Knight A6 has also got to be played. There's no alternative, so let's play this first. I understand this does allow bishop takes knight with tempo. I don't care. I don't think that... I think that bishop could eventually become useful, whereas it takes forever for this knight to get active. All right, so that's the obvious reply. Um... So I've kind of made this bishop invincible there. I think I just want to continue development. Um, so bishop d7 probably, or maybe even pawn b6. Yeah, pawn b6 seems reasonable. It all depends whether I want a half-open b-file or c-file. But the c-file is not useful with this bishop here. So let's go for a half-open b-file then. I don't very much like the idea that I'm going to exchange the bishop for the knight just to get my pieces out, but I don't see an alternative. My pieces are all running into each other, so I don't see anything better than this. And so now I can play knight b4 and start attacking stuff. Um, it's true that if he could get his rook onto my back rank, I'd be hosed, but I don't think he can do that. I'm pretty sure that's not on the agenda. So yeah, next is knight b4, then bishop a6, and then who knows. I'm still up a pawn, but this is a really disgusting position. Just in terms of trying to get my um, bishop around anywhere. All right, so I'll take my extra pawn and try to profit from it, which is like super greedy here. Um, I don't know if he just missed this or just thought that it's not that useful for me. We might have two very different evaluations of what's going on here, but I think I'm able to get my pieces active, and I don't think this bishop can checkmate me. Okay, so he sacrificed another pawn for some reason. Um, probably not how I would have pursued this, but maybe he's going for a draw? I'm not sure. Alright, so since I'm up two pawns, let's just do this. And he could take on b6 and get one of his pawns back, but um, my position's pretty great. And as long as I can get my rooks active in time, um, this is a position I'll be able to play. And not get mated. If he could somehow get both of his rooks onto the g-file this instant, I would be hosed. But I don't think he can do that. Or if he could get them both onto the c-file, again, I'd be in pretty great danger. Um, but yeah, as long as I manage to get all my pieces activated, then my extra pawn might prove useful in the endgame. Alright, so he might be trying to double on the c-file. My best attempt at resistance here, I think, is bishop d3, intending bishop c2. And if he plays rook c3, then I drop back to c4. And if he pushes b3, his rook's in the radius of this explosion. Um, so, oh, well, check that out. This is complicated. So now, 
Now we've got an endgame on our hands. Um... Wait, so why don't I just play bishop c2 here? Bishop c2 is supposed to be the easy move here. Does it not work? If I play b5, what's he going to do? Hmm. <laughs> I'm worried that b5 is overly defensive here. Actually, wait. Yeah, I think my key to getting out of this prison is to play b5 and a5 and the rook a3. Um, that's pretty difficult for him to stop. He's got to play bishop a5 at some point to stop my rook from getting developed. Hmm. My other ticket would be to somehow push c5 and knock it mated, maybe? Um, it's kind of a pipe dream. Try to calculate like future g5 and or c5 breaks. I want to see this end game. I don't know if this is winning or not, but I want to learn um, this end game theory. Right, so this is the predictable move. Um, I don't think it's that good. Honestly. Because we're both going to profit from having open files here, and my rook's actually on the open file. So, what's he thinking? It could be possible that um, the fact I can still castle might be the decisive factor here. If everything liquidates very quickly. Um, right, so he's got some intentions there. This gets in the way of his G, well, either rook uh, connecting with the other rook. Um, so if he wants to double, either way, I can still manage to put up some resistance. I think, though, in hindsight, maybe bishop e2 was stronger. The one thing is I can't play bishop c4 here. Unless his rook is... well, no, even if the rook's on c3, I still can't play it safely. Um, yeah, my king's safer on g8 than it is on e8. Because playing bishop g4 is no big deal. So I should get my king out of here. And have faith that I can win on the queen side. So now, now I'm able to play things like rook d7 or rook c8 and not worry about my king being too close to the action. Um, okay, so... I'm debating pawn takes a4. Yeah, in fact, that looks like super winning here. Well, no, I want to play rook c8 first. I want to stop rook c7 somehow.
Oh, I have stopped it because I have this threat of rook takes bishop. That's beautiful. So, yeah. If I take, and if he plays b5, I take, and he could play rook to c6, but I'm not afraid of it. Um, okay, well, I think I'm just doing excellent here. So, I'm running an a-pawn. Unless he takes it and activates my rook. Right, and if he plays b5, I can take this. Um, I could also do bishop takes. I think I should simply just take this way. And if he does rook c7, I take the bishop. And if he doesn't do rook c7, I play rook c8. Now, note that if I ever play like rook f7, um, okay. Yeah, this slows down his development, I believe. Okay, so let's block the c1 rook. This might end with perpetual. No, actually, each time the rook bounces back and forth, the bishop can approach it. So there's maybe not a perpetual pursuit there. Oh crap, there's rook b7. I thought I had rook b8 against rook b7. Uh, rook b8, though, doesn't adequately counter. So I'm forced to kind of go fish here. If he plays rook b7, I've got a sack on d8. And hope that I'm still okay. This is exciting, though. Yeah, so, gotta go fish. Uh, I can't leave so many pieces right next to my king. And this probably ends with a perpetual check. I don't think I have better. I have to be super careful, though. Um, like, if I play king h8, uh, my king gets pushed next to my g-pawn. Oh, crap. No, he's got rook g8, rook e8 anyway. Yeah. Okay, he got me. Well played, sir. Now, if he plays rook g7, my king does escape, but uh, he's not going to do that. I mean, it'd be great if he did, but um, I think even playing a simul, you find rook f8. And see that no matter where I move, it's still uh, mate in two. Yeah, so I think he played this really well. Um, I'm not sure, like, tactically I might have had something somewhere. Maybe I overpressed trying to win on the queen side. I don't know. Yeah, good game. Well played. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll throw a stockfish at this. Can I scroll the page down? I know the mouse wheel scrolls the move list, but I'd like to actually get to the button to do the analysis. Um, so, yeah. As for the opening, I was also curious. Um, whoops, 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 whoops. So, knight c3. The most popular move is c6, though knight h6 is playable. Against g4, I'm pretty sure you don't take it. In fact, yeah, I did play c6 here, and then against d4, then I took it, which really sucked. White has 
an amazing win rate from here. Um, yeah, so you just play e4 and finish your development. I played queen a5, which white has a 100% win rate against. So this might not be the best selection of opening moves by me. Um, taking g4 really opened the king's side, which was not useful for me. So I should have played something like e6 or g6 or d6. I'm sorry, that, that is e6 there. And d5 is not... Apparently d5 is popular, but it's not good. d6, yeah, I was worried about bishop takes knight. Um, I guess at least with e6 here, if they do do bishop takes knight, you can counter and get this knight off the board. Um, so, yeah, I missed this point, which is pretty important here. I need to remember that e6 is, like, super important in atomic opening theory. Um, alright, so shall we learn from our mistakes? Alright, so knight takes pawn was played, better is e6. Um, e4 was played, surely e6 is better than that. But there might have been, no. Okay, there's something even better, though. I don't know, g6? g6 is a good move? Nope. d5, is this okay? Yeah, d5 is fine. This gets your queenside pieces out. Um, here, I assumed that, oh, e6 is a blunder. Holy moly, how could this be a blunder? Is, I'm sorry, I meant to do d5. My mouse released too early. Yeah, just stopping pawn to d5 from happening. Okay, and then f4. Uh, this is apparently my one shot at freedom. Um, I wonder, what could it be? Like, I'd like to castle, but I just don't think it helps me. A5, maybe? Yeah, A5's not that great. Um... B5? Nope. A6. Bishop D7. Knight D7? Okay, Knight D7's okay, but the computer is thinking G5 here. In light of how the game finished, G5 here would have been an excellent move. Um, for no other reason than it's suggesting G4 gets played, and um, Black is happy with this. Black doesn't have to worry too much. Um, should b5. Okay, so... Am I supposed to just take him? No, I can't take that. What am I supposed to do? Just develop? No. Cast? No, g5 again. G5 is terrible here. Castle? No. What the heck? You can't tell me that there's a better move and then there's not one. I just take the knight? Okay. How is taking the knight better than uh, B6? I guess the reasoning is that I'm going to take the knight sooner or later, and I don't know where this bishop's going. I still want to push G5. Um, I'm not so sure I agree. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with the evaluation being that much different here. Apparently with b6, if he just runs away... Um... Yeah, I'm afraid I'm not following. Maybe this, the point is that bishop b5 is awful because... It puts the bishop on a square where it's prone to knight b4, and pawn takes b4, then hits the bishop. So maybe the engine's saying that bishop b5 is a mistake from the perspective that it gives me the b4 square for a tempo. And if I really, really want that tempo, uh, I've got to take on c3 immediately, 
and then plot my knight on d4. Whereas if I take it here, white could play things like b4 right away, and I can't take because now the bishop um, is no longer in the blast radius of b4. Um, so rook g1. Is this another circumstance where g5 is the winning move? No. Okay. Bishop takes c3 was also awful. I don't know. Do I just develop? No. Okay. So I can't take c3. I can't push my c pawn. Pretty sure knight c7 just loses a piece. What the heck am I supposed to do here? Rook g8? No. Um... Knight c5? Yeah, that didn't seem reasonable. Um... Yeah, I am out of ideas. Bishop a5 maybe? No, this loses a piece. Bishop f8? How am I supposed to move anything here and not lose material? I don't get it. Castle? Yeah, I, I just don't know. That's an original move. Would free up my C-pawn to move, that's for sure. Um, kind of a high expense. The move played in the game was bishop takes knight, which um, is not liked at all. So, yeah, I just don't know. It's very difficult to find a move which doesn't immediately lose the game. Let's see how many moves we can get through before I guess this correctly. We've already tried g5. Um, bishop a3 is the suggestion. I don't buy that. I'm sorry, that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, how could this possibly be any good? So the main line is 94 for some reason. DE4, Rook D1 castle and so forth and I guess we're saying that my bishop is just valueless in this position but why doesn't he just take the damn bishop is this something that's not easily justified by tactical means so okay Somehow, somehow this is advantageous for black. I don't get it. Why don't we just run away with the bishop? Okay, then we have a check. And we take the checking piece. Oh. No way. That can't be right, can it? We're saying that black has two pawns for, or three pawns for a bishop. Yeah, I don't understand this endgame at all. But apparently um, Stockfish really likes white's position, or black's position here. Does not like white's position. I, I don't know, man. Yes, there's no open file, but yeah, I just don't buy this.
We're saying this position remains closed for long enough for... Okay, so this stops c5. Bishop a6, fine, we tried to develop. Wait, why? I guess we don't have time to play bishop to b4. If white could play bishop b4, then there's a blockade. Like, if we get this, and black's just not paying attention, then bishop to b4 draws this. Um, but, yeah, because we have b4 immediately here, um, then black's okay. Jeez. But, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, apparently the bishops... Because the rooks can't break through, because there's no open file, um, black has two pawns, the A pawn and the B pawn, one of which is going to promote in this position. Um, yeah, I defy any human player in any kind of blitz game to figure out that kind of tactic. But... How many times, how many guesses did this take? If I remember right, that took me like 10 guesses to get. I looked at all the bishop moves, all these knight moves. Well, I didn't look at knight c5, did I? I don't remember. Knight c7, rook b8, castle, king f8, rook g1. Um... Bishop f8. That's about 10. Not quite, but... Oh yeah, and then bishop c3. I just confirmed that that wasn't the move that the engine was looking for. So, yeah, this makes me rethink uh, the values of the pieces in atomic chess. In particular, pawns could be just absolutely destructive. Um... If you give away, well, I had three pawns for a bishop at the end there, didn't I? This B pawn, which I didn't count in my calculation, that he has to give a pawn to take the bishop. And then I'm winning a pawn through tactical means with my D3 check, assuming that there's various crazy tactics and all these variations where, say, I play this check, and he doesn't take the knight. Like, if he does something else... Surely I have some way of doing something here. Yeah, so king e2, knight c1. I'm threatening a pawn. Oh, this is check. Is there any other way you could have pursued this? Like, king there. I'm still threatening a pawn. He's got to move the king away. Like, there's no way for white to keep... Okay, so, yeah, you have to count the b pawn. You have to count either the A or C pawn through all the various tactics that go on based on this king being trapped. Wait. Wait a second. So, I was saying pawn takes, knight b4. What about bishop e2? Oh, then it's just directly you just take on c2. In fact, in other lines, I'm pretty sure you could probably take c2 and it's just fine. Well, apparently knight d3 is still better. And what now? No. Wow. Okay. I remember now this is not standard chess. So you could just leave your knight there in the middle of the opposing position. Just play b5. And then play a5. And just wait. Let the tension continuously um, mount. And then at the critical moment figure out how to win the pawn and break through the past pawn or something crazy like that. Because uh, something like this would remove all of white's pieces. And even if white tries to move some of them out of the way, um, it's still total pain to like actually develop white's pieces. Black's pawns promote before white checkmates black. So yeah, that's atomic chess. Alright, so that's us learning from our mistakes. Oh, 
There's apparently one more mistake. I thought it said I was on 7 of 7, but now we're on 7 of 7 again. Bishop c4 loses. Um, I assume it's bishop e5, right? Oh, that's not good enough. Rook b8. Now, I didn't think this worked. I should have calculated it, of course. Despite it being this hour, day, night, or whatever you want to call it. Um, note that if rook c7, I just take the bishop, I think. Well, no, that's not so simple either. How's this go? Mate in 16. Oh, the other rook takes. Duh. Okay, I didn't see that. Probably would have failed to see it in the real game, which is sad, but... Um, yeah. Okay, so we do have to give the exchange, but under more favorable terms. Um, now, what prevents this from mating? Wait. Okay, so that rook is just loose there on b3. Um... 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 Okay. That's pretty crazy. I guess the point is that, like, if this rook could teleport to a7, black would be screwed. Um... But as it stands, white has no way to checkmate black. So because there's no mate, the pawn runs through and promotes. But anything else being different here, black could just be horribly, totally lost. Like, I wonder, why not rook b1? Oh right, black just gets out of this. So, because black's able to answer those to rook c7 and um, rook c8. Okay, so yeah, white has to defend. And <laughs> what shows off with rook b3, apparently. Okay, so do we have no better than a perpetual pursuit? No, white doesn't want to play that. White wants to repeat um, with rook a3. Okay, so then we don't get a repetition. Um, I still, oh, but black is up a pawn. So this cornered rook won't be good enough. Black promotes the h pawn, gg. It's a lot of work, but yeah. Black certainly can win this. We've learned from our mistakes. Oh my goodness. What an endgame. What an opening, too. Um, so the key insight is obviously don't take that. Um, C6 is good, but you have to follow it up with E6. Noting that if he takes your bishop, you've got this uh, pin so that you're not down in a material sense because i think knights are super useful for their ability to jump over and into the middle of positions and really mess up your opponent's position bishops are useful in the opening if your opponent has really really messed up um, and you need to clear some very specific squares to let your queen in but in general, I think knights are worth more than bishops, at least to a human. Anyway, yeah, well played, National Master CRP Tone. Um, good game. So thanks to one and all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.